O oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Where, wherefore art thou, Romeo? What does art mean? And what about thou? We're talking Old English today on this episode of Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig. Hello and welcome to the podcast. If you are a new listener, my name's Craig. And my name's Reza. And if you're not a new listener, thanks for coming back. With over 45 years of teaching between us, we're going to help you perfect your pronunciation, grow your grammar and vocalise your vocabulary. Hello Reza. Craig, how art thou? I'm very well. How art thou you? <laughs> Oh, very well, thank you. <laughs> Doesn't it sound strange speaking in Old English? It's really weird. Today we're all about Old English, but before we look at that and answer Nestor's question, we have had a comment on the website from our good friend and long-time listener, Marianne. What does Marianne say? She says, Hi, I've just listened to this interesting podcast about the last phrases that famous people said in their last moments. Oh, that was when we spoke about what famous people said before they died. That was back in uh, 158, so inglespodcast.com slash 158. And Marianne continues, And really, it is so philosophical to think about what would be your last words before dying. A bit depressing, maybe, but definitely yeah. philosophical. I would like to die. This is what she writes, eh? <laughs> I would like to die around my best friends, taking, you mean having or drinking a cup of coffee, thinking that I did the best that I could and that I definitely seized the time. Carpe diem. Carpe diem. Seize yeah. the day. Thanks is an excellent word to say, isn't it? Having finished my classes, I will have more time to listen to you. Thanks for your time and the possibility of learning English and having your thoughts and memories. Lots of love, Marianne. Thank you very much, Marianne. Yeah, thanks. It's really good to, to hear from you. And now that you've finished your classes, you have all the summer to catch up on our past episodes. We also have a voice message from Nestor from Valencia. Hi, Nestor. How are you? Hi. Yep. Our good friend Nestor, who is also a podcaster, he podcasts about the night sky and astronomy. We'll give you the link to his podcast at the end of the show. And he sent us a voice message. So let's listen to Nestor. Hello, Reza. Hello, Craig. This is Nestor from Valencia. Let's see. One of my favorite music groups is the English rock band Iron Maiden. And one of its most famous songs that I've been listening to for decades is called Hallowed Be Thy Name. Uh, when I was in school and in English, I tried to translate the lyrics of songs in order to understand them, and the title of this one called my attention. I discovered that a translation is something like santificado sea tu nombre o algo así. But the title included uh, a strange word for me, thy, T-H-Y. As far as I know, thy is an archaic word, uh, an old-fashioned pronoun, but it's not the only one. There are several more pronouns. There is thine, T-H-I-N-E. There is thou, T-H-O-U. There is also the, T-H-E-E. And uh, I don't know if there are more. I've been checked over time that these are words that appear almost exclusively in uh, songs like uh, Canciones de Iglesia, uh, Antiguas de Misa, vamos, y, y poco más. I would like you to explain to us the meaning of these words. If there is any difference in the meaning between these words and the modern pronouns, maybe the origin and if you consider it interesting, which other words are almost extinct in the current English, but we can still find from time to time in old books or, or songs. Not only archaic words from the time of Shakespeare, but words that were common in the 60s or in the 70s, and are almost disappeared or old-fashioned. And that's all. Thank you in advance, and I hope to see you soon. 
Bye. Thank you, Nestor, for sending your voice message. And yeah, we, we have to meet up soon. I hope to, to be seeing you very soon, uh, perhaps before the summer holidays. Let's get together. Yeah. Um, any comments, Rezo, about uh, Nestor's message? Yes, on the whole, Nestor, thou dost pronounce it um, <laughs> very well. <laughs> uh, yeah, on the whole, uh, Nestor, you're, you pronounce very well. Uh, there's um, not a lot wrong with your, your pronunciation. So, yeah, so one, one thing I noticed when Nestor says the word pronoun, he stresses the second syllable. He says pronoun. Remember, it's the first syllable, so it's pronoun. Thy is a pronoun. And also there was one word, you said the word pronounce as if it were a noun. What You said, what is the modern pronounce? You should use the noun, not the verb. So what is the modern pronunciation? Good questions, Nestor. Very good questions. And where can we begin, Craig? Well, I hadn't heard the song Hallowed Be Thy Name by Iron Maiden, although I do know the group. So I listened to it on YouTube and I've put a link in the show notes. So if you want to hear and listen to the song that Nestor is speaking about, go to englishpodcast.com slash 167. Words like thou, thy, thine, there's ye, Y-E, and the, T-H-E-E, etc. You don't hear them. We don't hear them these days, do we? They tend to be, as Nestor says, sometimes in songs, but more commonly in those songs that you hear in church that are called hymns, H-Y-M-N-S. Although, of course, in all languages this happens, there are exceptions um, depending on regional um, idiosyncrasies. For example, in the north of England, particularly in Yorkshire, uh, which we'll be talking about again later in this episode, in Yorkshire they do say the still. Yeah. The is quite common in rural parts of Yorkshire. Especially, For example, especially in villages, in small villages, villages. and communities. Yeah. Uh, sit down in English or sit yourself down in normal English. They might say, sit thee down. Sit thee down, lad. The the means you. Sit yourself down. Sit thee down. Sit thee down. Yeah. And in Northern Ireland, we use ye quite a lot. Well, we can kind of pronounce it as ye. It comes out as ye. So we would say, sit ye down. Mm -hmm. So we, we say ye, actually. Yeah, and I think in Scotland as well, in certain circumstances. So there are a few re regional kind of variations where these words do persist, but they tend to be used only in certain fixed expressions like sit thee down or sit ye down. Yep. In Yorkshire, somebody wouldn't say, I will give thee a cup of tea. That doesn't sound very typical, but sit thee down is a, is a common expression where thee has survived. And in Northern Ireland, sit ye down, it, it has survived. But we, would, we don't always say ye. We don't say, for example, I am going to help ye. We don't, we don't say that. We say I'm going to help you. So it tends to be in fixed phrases, Nestor, where they survive. So yeah, these words are not used in common everyday conversation. But let's look at the meaning of some of these, because the word thou, T-H-O-U, as you might guess, means you. So when you have the sentence, O Romeo, O Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo, thou is you, but only when it's the subject of the sentence. So in this example, Romeo is the subject, so the word thou is used as you. Now, art, which is also in that sentence, A-R-T, wherefore art thou, means be. It's a form of the word to be. And wherefore, in this context, means what is the purpose of in Shakespearean English. So the sentence really means, and it is quite a famous Shakespeare quote, it really means, oh, Romeo, oh, Romeo, what is the purpose of you being Romeo? As Craig said, art is a form of the verb to be, a form. In other words, a conjugation. In mm -hmm. English, we used to, hundreds of years ago, conjugate the verbs just like Spanish, French, German, Italian do. But of course, we haven't really done that for about 400 years. It was around about the time of Shakespeare that it, 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 had, it had started to die off, die away. So Shakespeare uses a bit of conjugation from time to time, but not always. So that's kind of the period where it's beginning to disappear. But if you go back to English of about 700 years ago, then it's full of conjugation. It kind of looks like German. 
where they conjugate everything. But we've simplified English and got rid of those conjugations. Reza, when you were in school growing up, did you have to say the Lord's Prayer? I certainly did. Yep. I, I had to say it every day in assembly in the morning. Me too. Every single day. And I learned it through repetition. I learned it off mm -hmm. by heart. And that's where the expression hallowed be thy name which Nestor chose as one of his favorite songs it comes from the Lord's Prayer the word hallowed as Greg said earlier santificado think about the word Halloween yeah that's true it's hallowed evening sagrado or santificado yeah, yeah. vispera santificada hallowed evening but it's got shortened to Halloween Halloween yeah that's true Let's read the Lord's Prayer for those listeners who don't know it and haven't heard it. Um, so here's the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So let's look at that a little closely, because there are some old-fashioned words in there. Mm -hmm. Just before we look at the actual English, if you were translating that and you were finding it quite easy enough to translate... Um, you might have found great difficulty with the last couple of lines. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for and ever and ever. Because they don't exist in the Spanish version of the Lord's Prayer. Because only Protestants add that part. I didn't know that. Yep. The Spanish Lord's Prayer ends with, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah, the first line our Father, which art in heaven. We said before that art is a version of the verb to be. So really, who, who is in heaven? Like our Father who is in heaven. Um, what words can we learn from the second one? How do it be thy name? Uh, now, the word be, you already know, but we're using it here in a strange form. Really, we're saying your name is hallowed. That's what we really want to say. Your, thy, thy is your your name and be is hallowed. Why don't we say is? Well, because in old-fashioned English, quite often we put the verb to be in the infinitive form, even though it's going with uh, the second person singular, with thy. Thy be means you are. Mm -hmm. And thy in the third line, thy kingdom come, thy means your, but... It's used before a consonant sound K or K or N, N. So, for example, thy name, because name begins with the N sound, you use thy. And because kingdom become, reino become, begins with a K sound, you use thy as well. And in, and in the next line, thy will be done. Mm -hmm. Thy will. Thy will here means uh, your, what you want to happen in Spanish, voluntad. And then it continues, as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, our bread every day, that's easy, and forgive us our trespasses. Well, to trespass in the use of it today means entrar illegamente, like to go on somebody's land illegally. So if you own property and somebody goes inside your property and walks on your land, you can say that they are trespassing. But in this old meaning, it means pecar, to sin, to do something against God, to commit a sin. It goes on, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And the next line is very interesting. Who, so it would be who sin against us. Yeah. Who sin against us. The next line is, and lead us not into temptation. Now, there's no word there which is difficult to understand. That would be more or less the same in modern English. It's just the word order, and lead us not it's strange to put the word not there. Yeah, because we would probably say in modern English, don't lead us. Yeah, and don't lead us into temptation. But in old-fashioned English, we make it, we start positive and lead us, and then we put the not, lead us not into temptation. And then, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom. Now, we had the word thy before, T-H-Y. Thine means your, 
exactly the same as thy, but it's used before a vowel sound. Now, thine is the kingdom, is begins with the vowel, vocal, i, is. So you use thine and not thy. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. What about the T-H-E-E razor, which does not appear in the Lord's Prayer? But what does that mean, the? Well, it's another form of you. So thou means you and the means you. However, thou is the subject form and the is the object form. Remember, if you're a little confused listening to this, you can always find show notes to the episodes so you can follow as we're speaking. So for this episode, go to englishpodcast.com slash 167. You can see these words written on our webpage. Craig, can I ask you a question or can I say something in Old English and can you say it back to me in Modern English? I'll try. Um, Don't know if I'll be correct, but I'll try (laughs) I love thee. Dost thou love me? I love you. Do you love me? That's it. Is that right? It would be, I love thee. Because thee there is the object form. And then I asked him, dost, which is the old-fashioned form of do, do. dost thou love me? So is dost thou, thou is the subject form of you there. Is that from the Bible? No, no, I just thought of it now. Oh, okay. Very good. (laughs) Impressed. Another example of thee from a Chinese proverb that I found. If thine enemy wrong thee, buy each of his children a drum. I'll repeat that. If thine enemy wrong thee, buy each of his children a drum. How could you change that into more modern understandable english if your enemy wrongs you does something against you wrongs you buy each of his children a drum i like that i like the idea that the kids the children get a drum and they make a lot of noise and really annoy their (laughs) their parents i didn't understand that that's what i think it means no i understood it more be kind to the people who are your enemies it's it reminded me of the saying el dicho um, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. Ah, oh, could be that, yeah. But for me, the fact that it's a drum draws my attention because drums are bloody noisy. They are bloody annoying, and, and that would they? really annoy the father. Then that could be his punishment. Yeah. <laughs> if your neighbour annoys thee, buy a drum. <laughs> no, 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 don't buy your neighbour a drum. That's the worst thing you no, could do. Buy, buy yourself a drum. Buy yourself a drum. Exactly. <laughs> Um, moving on, ye, Y-E, that means you, but the plural of you. Now, you may have noticed, Spanish speakers, that we do not have a plural form of you. If I said, you are making too much noise, it's impossible to know if I'm speaking to one person or a group of people, because we don't have the S, the plural form that you have in Spanish for ustedes, for example. So we have similar expressions like you people or you all or all of you, but not one pronoun. So the Old English ye is the plural for you when you're addressing a group of people. And there's a Christmas carol, isn't there, Reza? A song that we sing every year at Christmas. Well, some people do, which has that word ye in it. Would you like to sing it for us? Yes, feel free to jump in when you like. O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Wow, what do you think of that, listeners? I think there is nobody now listening to this podcast. We've just lost all our listeners. All our audience. It was nice to have known you. (laughs) Thanks for listening up to now. 
So it ye... was lovely to know ye. <laughs> lovely to know ye. It was lovely to know ye, and we know ye no more. <laughs> we know ye no more. Ye is also sometimes used to represent an early modern English form of the word the. Such as maybe you see sometimes if you're traveling around in small villages in the UK and those lovely, picturesque, beautiful little villages in the north of England, in Yorkshire, in the Lake District, you may see ye old shop. How's that spelt? Well, Y E O L D E S H O P E, form of Old English. If you see ye old shop, in this case, it can. Um, represent the so the old shop is what it means and just to remind you as i was saying earlier in in northern ireland as well as being ye the old-fashioned plural form of of you it can also be just our pronunciation of the singular you yeah like sit you down or there's certain phrases which are very common in northern ireland i must tell a quick anecdote about when i was a kid there was a, a man who used to get on the bus when i came home from school and he was always drunk Every single time without fail. Incredible. I know a man in Belfast always drunk. That's incredible. And he used to get on the bus and he only ever said the same phrase time and time again. He was so drunk, he could only say one phrase. Um, he just became very kind to people and he became very emotional because of the alcohol. And all he said was in his Belfast accent, God love ye. Ah, God love ye. Which, mate, God love you. Yeah. But that's all he said to people, but with ye. It look you right in the angle. Ah, God love ye. <laughs> with his in very alcoholic breath. <laughs> and that's the only words I ever heard come out of his mouth. And God love ye is a very common expression in Northern Ireland. It's the sort of thing people say. Uh, it's similar to like, oh, bless. Oh, God, God be with you, maybe. Yeah. God no, go. no. It's like in English when you're uh, an English person, an English person from England, I mean, is, uh, you know, um, making fun of you and they go, Oh, bless. Like, bless, bless him. Oh, poor ah, you. Poor bless you. Him. A bit silly. We say in Northern Ireland, God love ye. <laughs> right, so there are some auxiliary verbs in Old English. What are they? Well, uh, don't try and use these, but perhaps recognize them. We got woodst, which is wood. Couldst, could. So you're adding an ST on the end, yeah? Yeah. Shouldst, should. Canst equals can. Hast equals has. have, have or has, have or and has. dost, do, and wilt, will. And they conjugate with thou. So wouldst thou, wouldst thou stop and uh, sup with me? That means, <laughs> would you like to have dinner with me? <laughs> For example, wouldst thou have a cup of tea? Would you have a cup of tea? Wouldst thou pass me a biscuit? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sounds so strange. Shouldst thou, shouldst thou be going to Mercadona? Uh, couldst thou buy me some um, bread, please? And there's an example of some of these words in a quotation by William Alexander from the, from the 15th, no, from the 17th century, from 1604, from, uh, is it a poem to Aurora? That's it. Mm -hmm. could, you, could you read it for us? Okay. I don't know what accent I should use. Nobody knows. So I'll, I'll just see whatever comes out of my mouth. Oh, if thou knewst how thou thyself dost harm, and dost prejudge thy bliss and spoil my rest, then wouldst thou melt the ice out of thy breast, and thy relenting heart would kindly warm. What's a relenting heart? Well, to relent is to finally um, capitulate after a lot of saying no. You say, no, 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 no. And finally, all right, yes. That so is too you, a phrasal verb would be give in. Give in. Give in to something and say yes. Yeah. So I suppose it's about a man trying to persuade a woman to be his his girlfriend, his lover. And she keeps saying no, no, no. She has a a, a, a heart of ice. Yeah, I like, I like that part. To melt the ice out of thy breast. I like that. Because presumably the breast, because that's where her heart is. So moving on to the pronunciation of Old English or Oldie English, um, do we know how Shakespeare might have sounded? Shakespeare's accent, did he have one? Ni jota idea. Okay. No, we have no idea for sure, although there are theories. 
I don't, I don't think we really know what he looks like because I think there were only three portraits of him and again it's not clear if it's really him or his dad so not many people know a lot about Shakespeare actually yeah how people spoke them there were no recorders of any type no cds no computers no tape recorders no gramophones nothing so we can only use research to try and imagine and some scholars have researched into this in fact, there's a theory which I've read in more than one place, actually, that Shakespeare, because he was from the Midlands himself, uh, from uh, Stratford-upon-Avon, Stratford. Stratford. yeah. that his accent might have sounded a bit like a kind of mixture of modern Yorkshire mm -hmm. with Irish or Northern Irish plus Midlands, that's the kind of Birmingham area, and the southwest of England, an American. Kind of all that mixed <laughs> together is the theory. So it might not have been easy to understand mm -hmm. him. Yeah, not not for us today. It might I, have been quite difficult. I tell you what, he must have had an English teacher. I would have hated. Can you imagine being Shakespeare's English teacher? What would you write? Room for improvement. Yeah, must what try harder. <laughs> <laughs> not bad. <laughs> So the one thing I think many scholars or most scholars do agree about is that Shakespeare certainly didn't speak like most Shakespearean actors speak today. Yeah. The kind of classic modern Shakespearean accent is Romeo, Romeo, wherefore thou? Very kind of posh. And Shakespeare almost certainly did not speak like that himself, strangely enough. And there's someone who has done a lot of interesting research into the origin of Shakespeare and actors from about 400 years ago, isn't there, Reza? Who, who's that? Well, Sir David Crystal, who's very well known to all of us who are interested in linguistics and anything to do with teaching languages, uh, who incidentally, by the way, is, was born in the same town as me, a place called Lisburn near Belfast, but as you will hear from the clip, his accent is nothing like mine because he didn't spend much time there. But he's an expert in things like accents and Old English and that type of thing. And he's done interesting research into the original accent of the actual actors that Shakespeare would have used about 400 years ago. And you can look at it if you follow the, the link that we've put in this podcast. That's episode 160. Seven. So go to englandpodcast.com 167 and you'll find a short but very interesting YouTube clip about people actually imitating what they think the Shakespearean actors would have sounded like. And you might find it quite shocking and quite amusing. The voice is kind of, it's kind of funny, actually. Is it uh, Sir David Crystal speaking on the clip? There are two people, him and his son, who's also an expert and a Shakespearean actor. Yeah, because that's right. He wrote a, a book about Shakespeare in English with his son. And um, if uh, you're interested in finding out more, I've been listening to an interview, a two-part interview that our friend Luke has done with Sir David over at teacherluke.co.uk. So if you haven't heard Luke's English podcast, definitely recommended, especially a recent interview he's done with uh, with Sir David uh, Crystal on linguistics and how it can help you improve your English. Although David Crystal was never actually taught English, he has given so much support and advice and help to teachers of English and written loads of books and done lots of research into linguistics and accents. And he's a, a really fascinating man. Yes, he's a very lucky man. Rather than actually teach English all his life, he's had real jobs. He's very fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> In written books. Anyway, thank you very much for your question, Nestor. We had a lot of fun uh, researching and uh, looking into old English. And Nestor also has a podcast. If you go to nestorgm.com, you can uh, listen to Nestor's podcast called Luthers Estranias, which is all about the night sky astronomy from an everyday man's perspective. So it's not very academic, it's not very highbrow, it's normal people who have an interest in stargazing and discovering the night sky as definitely recommended if that is your hobby. 
Thanks very much, Nestor, for your question. And thanks for being one of our patrons. So, answering Nestor's question got us thinking a little about words that we don't use anymore. Words and expressions and even professions that are no longer used in the English language. For example, when was the last time you said the words floppy disk? Well, a long time ago, the 90s. Yeah. Yeah, the 90s at the, at the latest, yeah. Because they don't even make computers with floppy disks anymore. Yeah. Just for the, maybe those of you listening who have no idea what we're talking about, the floppy disk was that thing which looks a bit like a disk, but it was square, in fact, from the outside, but it had a round disk inside, which you couldn't see. It was usually black plastic. Which I assume was floppy, which means not rigid. Well, the weird thing hard. is they weren't floppy for very long. Apparently, only the very, very uh, first models were floppy. And pretty soon, even they started to become hard. So floppy means that something is not hard. But in fact, the floppy disks soon became hard. What provoked them to get hard, I'm not sure. But That's a mystery. They got hard. Somehow they got hard. Um, so that's no longer used. Also, tape recorder is slowly fading, if not completely gone, really, almost from everyday English, because now we have CDs, we have hard drives, but not tape recorders, reel-to-reel -reel tapes, um, not really used anymore. Do you have any tapes at home, any cassette tapes? I do. The thing is, I haven't got a tape recorder to play them on, but... Mm. I'm, I kind of don't want to throw them away. The tapes have a sentimental value for me. Also, everything's recorded on hard drives now, so we don't really use VHSs. VHS, the video home system, um, recording TV programs in real time on a tape. That doesn't happen anymore, does it? No. No, indeed, it doesn't. And even older than VHS, you've got Betamax. Do you remember them? Mm -hmm. They kind of competed with VHS for a while to see who would win. And VHS won. And Betamax quickly disappeared, like way back in the 70s or 80s. And then VHS then disappeared, what, about 10, 15, 15 years ago? They began to disappear as well. Yeah, it's happened with a lot of of competing companies. Um, Kodak, I remember, were in the camera business, Kodak Film, and they didn't really compete as they should have. And now you don't really hear of Kodak. Can you think of any more words that we don't use anymore? Well, I can think of some professions that no longer exist. Uh, but of course, you, you read about them in, in literature or in old films, like a chimney sweep. Yeah, we don't we don't have chimneys so much, and we definitely don't have little kids or small men or women who go up to clean the chimney. Yeah. Chimney. If you kind of think of Victorian London, yeah, you know, kind of about uh, 150 years ago, little boys usually w going inside chimneys to clean them. Uh, it's a very kind of stereotypical image of Victorian England that those little boys, sometimes men, were the chimney sweeps. To sweep is to clean something. And bell ringer. How do you say bell in Spanish? Campana. Cam campana. And a person who rings a bell? Campanero. <laughs> or campanera, if it's a woman. Another profession that's not... Uh, that has died out, which means no longer exist. If something dies out, it stops existing, is a lamp lighter. A person who used to go in the street from lamp to lamp, lighting it when lamps were gas uh, before they were electricity. So we don't have that anymore. And maybe your parents or grandparents remember in different, uh, in Spain or, or, or in Central or South America, in your local villages, maybe people went from lamp to lamp uh, in the evening, lighting the lamps. Another profession, Reza, that has died out is a milkman. Did you have a milkman when you were growing up in Belfast? I certainly did, yeah. And my mum kept the milkman on as as long as she could until I think the, the company just stopped and went out of business. But she liked having a milkman, even though it was quite expensive. And for younger listeners, a milkman was a man or a woman who drove around the houses street by street, bringing the milk and butter 
and eggs right to your door. And you paid him or her every week, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, Craig, the milkman was supposed to enjoy certain perks in British society. What, what perks were they? What benefits were they? There are many, many jokes of milkmen sleeping with housewives, housewives and having sex during the day when the husbands were out at work. But I think that was more, yeah. uh, more of a urban myth than it, anything else. It's, it's the British version of El Butanero, isn't it? The Butanero here is, is supposed to enjoy such benefits. Isn't and, he? and with the Butanero, butanero when you hear the, the banging of the gas bottles together in the van, similarly with the milk float, F-L-O-A-T, the vehicle that transported the milk, you used to hear the bottles rattling together in the crates. Do you remember that? Yeah. And I suppose that's when the, the housewives got ready to, to welcome the milkman. <laughs> To the front door. Let's move on swiftly. I think we should. Another uh, profession that has uh, died out and something my mum did when she was very young, a switchboard operator. Reza, how would you describe the job of a switchboard operator? Wasn't that the person who had loads of cables, electrical cables to deal with, and they had to stick one in in one hole and one in another, depending on where you wanted to be connected up to in the days of analog telephone? Yeah, that, that phrasal verb, to put someone through, to connect them. So you'd hear, I'm putting you through, sir. And they'd put the plug to connect you to another department. I always think of old black and white films where they, they called up the operator or the switchboard operator and they had to give their number or something like that and who they wanted to get in touch with. And the numbers only had about four digits. Yeah. Like nobody had a phone. It's like, yes, this is New York 2578. And I want to get through to Chicago 574. Well, there's only like 500 people in New York have a phone. <laughs> Pennsylvania 65, was it Pennsylvania 65,000, the song? Yeah. Another one, a rat catcher. What's rat in Spanish? That's rata, isn't it? Yeah. Not so a person who would catch rats in the street, which I think we need in Valencia. I've yeah. seen a few rats in this city. They still do exist. There still are rat catchers, I think. Are there? Yeah. Municipal rat catchers do exist. Yeah. What's a town crier? Cry means llorar. I, they still exist in villages in Spain. The person who who walks around crying, shouting, uh, saying what the the latest news is or what events are going to happen in that town. Yep. It's the preganero, isn't it? Preganero, that's it. Is that the word in Spanish? Yeah. Going back to Nestor's question at the beginning of the episode, they used to ring a bell, didn't they, and shout, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye, three times to announce the news. So there's that old English ye coming in again. The last one we've got, Craig, and I'll leave it up to you to explain, is the bowling alley pin setter. Well, most of our listeners have probably at some point or another in their lives been bowling. You go to a bowling alley, a place where you bowl the ball, and now there's a machine that puts the pins in place, the pins that you knock over. Well, in the old days, before machines, a person used to stand at the end of the alley and set up, which means prepare, the pins for you to throw the ball. So a bowling alley pin setter is a profession that's no longer needed because of mechanisation. Craig, there was a job which I really wanted to do as a kid. I wanted to be a points man. What's that? Do you know what that is? No. A points man uh, is the man, I suppose it could have been a woman as well, but they tended to be men, who... Uh, got hold of a big lever and just pulled it to change the direction of a train. <laughs> Seriously, when I was a kid, I was kind of obsessed with that. Is that because you'd only have to work three or four times a day for five yeah. seconds? Yeah, and it was like left or right. You put the lever one way, the train goes that way. You put it the other way, it goes the other way. A points man. Imagine that was a job. I always wanted to be the man on the motorway with the sign that directs the traffic when they're working on the road. What power! What power to change the direction of traffic and just stand there all day and get paid for it? Or do you remember years ago when they used to fix telephone cables out in the street and they put up one of these red and white kind of kiosks? You don't see them much anymore. Mm -hmm. And I always wonder, what, what goes on inside those kiosks? And I looked in from time to time and they seemed to be always having a flask of tea and a sandwich. I never saw any work going on, yeah. ever.
just before we uh, finish this week's podcast and say goodbye, I want to test you, Reza, on some words that are no longer used in English and see if you know the meaning. Are you ready? Yes, that sounds really easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the first word is a noun. Snout fair. S-N-O-U-T-F-A-I-R. What's a snout fair? Well, listeners, I honestly haven't seen these words. I'm guessing snout could be a nose and snout fair. Fair. Is it F-A-R-E, you said? Yes. Fair can be can be food. Snows, snows, food, food, food. Snout for food that smells good or something. I don't know. Close. It's a person with a handsome face. A good-looking well, person is a snout fair. Okay. Or was a snout fair. Remember, these words, don't learn these words. These words are not used anymore. I'm just having some fun with Reza. Uh, next one is a verb. To gerbil. J-I-R-B-L-E. A verb, you say? Yep. To gerbil. It's not the animal then. If you gerbled whiskey, what are you doing? Hmm. Well, I only know that the animal gerbil, so a verb? I don't know. I'm trying to think, what, what do the gerbils, the animals do? It might be something nope. that they do, nothing like that. Nothing to do, I'll tell you. Gerb- is, is it a bit like gurgling? Is it similar to gurgling? Not really. Oh, it okay. means to pour out, to pour is echal liquido. So to pour out a liquid with an unsteady hand. So if you gerbled out some whiskey, you'd pour the whiskey, but not in a steady, controlled way. So Oh, I've gerbled quite a lot then. I think you have gerbled. Uh-huh. I think you'll like the next one. Lunting. L-U-N-T-I-N-G. Lunting. Well, I'm, I'm, if I Reza take, was lunting down the street. If I take away the I-N-G, maybe that might give me an infinitive verb. To lunt. What could that be? To lunt. You won't guess it. It's walking, <laughs> it's walking while smoking a pipe. Really? Yep. What a brilliant verb. Yep. Um, adjective is our next word. Famelikos. Famelikos. This is me. I am Famelikos. Famelikos. F-A-M-E-L-I-C-O-S-E. Famelikos. Something to do with families? Nope. A person who is constantly hungry. If you're constantly Ah. hungry, you are Famelikos. Okay, you're famished. Yes. Okay, famished, very hungry, Famelikos. Right, I see the connection now with famished. Next one's a noun, pussy van. P U S S Y V A N. I'm not sure I want to answer this. Uh, <laughs> it means it means to um, have a temper, a flurry. Really? To be yeah, to be angry. You say yep. like he's a pussy van. He's a pussy van. He's, he's very always, bad temper. He's always angry. He's always mad. He's always wow. in, always has a bad temper. What a weird word. Very strange. I love the next one. Kerglaf. Also a noun. C U R G L A W F. Kerglaf. Is it a sound that people make? Close. It could be. It's the shock you feel when you jump into very cold water. Wow. Which I think we need that word. We need to bring that word back. Yeah. Can you just imagine? He jumped into the pool and Kirk laughed. Yeah. Yeah, I like that word. Next one's a verb. Groak. G-R-O-A-K. Sounds a bit like croak with a C. Which is what, you know, the sound you kind of go like. No, you, you won't get it. It means to silently. Because <laughs> these words are just not, we're not, we're not, we don't use these. To silently watch someone while they are eating and hoping to be invited to join them. Oh, wow. Isn't that interesting? Groke. To groke. Say. Yep. Okay. Razor groked me while I was eating my <laughs> breakfast. And the last one's an adjective. Englishable. Englishable. Not used anymore. It's an adjective, something that can be changed into English. Yeah, I, I, I could have guessed You could have guessed that. I didn't yeah. give you a chance. I could have guessed that, yeah. I apologise. So remember, do not learn those words. Just a bit of fun to test Reza. And now it's your turn to practice your English. Do you, like Nestor, have a question for us or an idea, perhaps, for a future episode? Send us a voice message and tell us what you think. We love hearing your voices, and you can contact us by voice on speakpipe.com slash podcast, Or send us an email with a comment or question to me, Craig, at com, Or to me, Reza, at belfastreza at gmail.com. 
And if you would like to join our Patreon program for more detailed show notes, go to patreon.com slash English podcast. And we'd like to thank our lovely sponsors who are Nikolai, Anna, Pedro, Manuel, Maite, Lara, Maria, Sara Harbo, Carlos, Zara, Mamen, Juan Leiva Guerrera, Cory, Mariel Reiderman, Jorge, Raul, Rafael, Manuel, Agus, Manuel, Nestor Garcia Mañez, who asked the question in this episode, and our recent sponsor, Juan Carlos. Thank you very much. Remember, if you are sponsoring our show, there's a free PDF waiting for you on the Patreon page about how to pass a job interview in English. And it also has an MP3 audio for you to download. We'd also like to thank Arminda from Madrid and Alberto from Granada, as well as Angelica Bello from Madrid, who are continuing to transcribe their podcasts. So you'll be able to see every single word we say, thanks to them. So far, they've done from 131 to 142. So slowly they're, they're getting there. So thanks very much to those guys for, for doing those transcriptions. Yeah, us. thanks so much. And Angelica also has transcribed the very first episode, episode number one. Reza, what's next week? On next week's episode, Ivan's true English story. With a special guest, I believe. With a very special guest. We'll have to wait till next week to find out who that could be. Keep you in suspense. So thanks for listening. Join us next week. And until then, it's goodbye from Reza. And it's goodbye from Craig. The music in this podcast is by Pitts. And the track is called See You Later. And vocalise your vocabulary. Hello, Reza. How art thou, Craig? How art thou, Reza? I'm Craig. <laughs> no, that's me. Uh, uh, how art thou, Craig? <laughs> I'll speak again. <laughs> I'm not sure. Who am I? Oh, I'm Reza. Craig, how art thou? <laughs>